So good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Happy Tuesday. Um, so my name is Beth Rakowski, and I'm the Director of Training at UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Programs. And I also am the co-director of the Pacific Southwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Um, so our, uh, our network is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We've been the home of the ATTC since 2002. And we've been working with Tom and um, his team at the AETC since about 2004. So it's a long partnership. Um, this particular project, though, is, has been around for the past nine years, uh, where we've been developing curricula for HIV clinicians on a topic related to substance use. And so this actually was the first curriculum that we wrote for, uh, for Phil and Tom back in 2010, 2011. And uh, a lot has changed. There's a lot of new information about the impact of alcohol on HIV disease. And so we made the decision to do a, an update. So what you're going to see today is brand new information about the intersection of HIV and alcohol use and how, like Tom said, how it impacts the care continuum. So here's our collaborators. Uh, it's been a, an amazing partnership. I see some familiar faces, so I, I know we've, uh, we've interacted with one another over the years. Um, it really, not many ATTCs are working with their AETC partners so closely. So it's nice to sort of lead, be leading the nation in, um, in this work. And if you figure, you know, if you go figure, like there is a relationship between HIV disease and, and substance use. And so the curricula we've developed over the years, I, I find them to be extremely valuable to, to the workforce, to the HIV workforce. So we have, um, we have a lot of time together this morning. It, it may or may not take the full four hours, so um, you may get to leave a little early. Um, but there is four parts of the presentation. So we'll start off by talking about how does alcohol work in the user's brain and body, and how, like, what are the acute and chronic effects. Well, I'll show you some data on the patterns and trends in who's using alcohol. Uh, and most of the data I'm going to share with you today is, is national data. Um, and I have, I have a sense of what's going on locally in LA County. Uh, and then we can, all, we can have a conversation about what you're seeing among your patients that you're treating. Then uh, one of the hearts of the presentation is looking, doing a deeper dive into the intersection between alcohol and HIV. And then lastly, we'll spend some time looking at how can you screen or assess your patients for alcohol use, and then what treatments are, are available for folks who have an alcohol use disorder. So instead of spending time going around the room saying who you all are, I'm, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions just to sort of get a sense of who's in the room. Um, so how many of you are case managers? All right, how about... Um, Social workers. How about marriage and family therapists? Awesome. Nurses? Uh, doctors? Do we have any doctors? How about uh, physician assistants or nurse practitioners? How about um, clinic administrators? No. How about counselors or therapists? Who am I, who am I missing? I know I'm missing someone. Health educators? Psychologist. Oh, yeah, psychologists. Any psychologists? Yeah. Public health investigators. <laughs> Excellent. And um, are you all working primarily in an HIV care setting? Do we have anyone working in a, a SUD program or a mental health program? Okay, good. Excellent. That's really helpful just to know who's in the room. So just objectives for what we're going to accomplish today. Uh, we're going to look at some key terms related to alcohol use and at-risk drinking. We'll look a little bit at the way that alcohol impacts your brain and body. We'll talk about alcohol and HIV, and then we'll talk about treatment. So many of you have been to these trainings before. So you remember the ARS clickers that we used to use? Yeah, so we're not using those anymore. And so like Sandra said, we've gone, we've moved towards poll everywhere. This is the first time I'm using it in a presentation, so this should be interesting. So if you haven't already done so, uh, log into the Wi-Fi, and you can either go to the Poll Everywhere site, or you can text LARATC, and uh, that way you'll be able to give us your responses. So I'm going to ask you a few questions now, 
and then I'm going to ask you the same questions at the end of the training. The hope is if you get the answer wrong now, you're going to get it right later because I'm going to give you all the answers over the next few hours. So the first question is, at-risk drinking levels are the same regardless of the drinker's age or gender. Is that true or false? How many people are in the room, like 40-ish? Yeah, okay. So true or false, at-risk drinking levels are the same regardless of your age or gender. I'm going to wait until, you get up, uh, until we get up to 20 and then I'll move on. Come on, two more. Okay, so about 80% eight, of you said false, 20% said true. How about the neurotransmitter? So which of the four, what are the four main neurotransmitters relevant to alcohol? So you've got dopamine, serotonin, GABA, and glutamate. Serotonin, GABA, endorphin, and norepinephrine. Endogenous opioids, glutamate, GABA, and dopamine. Or endogenous, uh, endogenous opioids, glutamate, endorphin, and norepinephrine. All right, so I'm not going to tell you what the answer is, but no one got it right. <laughs> uh, it's, that's, that's a, that, was a, that was a tricky one. Uh, how about nationwide binge drinking rates are higher among men than women? Is that true or false? Who's, drinking, who's binge drinking more, men or women? All right, the majority of you said that's a true statement. So we'll see in just a bit if that's correct. Okay, so decreasing alcohol use among HIV patients can reduce which of the following? Medical, consequence, medical and psychiatric consequences of consumption, other drug use, transmission, or all of the above? All right, good. And lastly, the goals of effective medication-assisted treatment for alcohol use disorders should be which of the following? Short-term stabilization and withdrawal, a treatment of last resort, ongoing maintenance, A and C, or none of the above. All right, so the majority of you who responded said, um, it could be either for short-term stabilization and withdrawal or ongoing maintenance. So like I said, you'll, get the, you'll, you'll see over the next couple of hours the correct answers. So it's important when we're talking about alcohol to talk about some key terms because a lot of the research that I'm going to show you uses specific definitions to describe patterns of alcohol consumption amongst individuals. And so at-risk drinking is any kind of alcohol use that exceeds the recommended limits. And in just a few minutes, I'll, sh I'll share with you what that means. You know, what is a standard drink? What are the low risk drinking limits? So basically any alcohol use that exceeds that limit, is consi is consi it's considered at risk because it's putting the individual at risk for a variety of health problems, whether it's physical health issues, um, psychological issues, or um, putting them at risk for diseases such as HIV, hepatitis C, et cetera. A standard drink is an alcoholic beverage that contains 14 grams of alcohol. What the heck does that mean? I'll tell you in just a minute. Hazardous drinking is really a pattern of use that puts someone at risk for adverse health events. Along those same lines, harmful, hazardous and harmful drinking is, is similar, although harmful drinking takes it one step further and it is drinking that results in adverse events, whether it's psychological or physical harm. Binge drinking is, um, is really a pattern of use where you consume a lot of alcohol in a short time frame. And so the definition is that it gets your blood alcohol content up to 
above 0 0.08, which is the legal limit in most places. Parenthetically, uh, Utah just passed a law to lower the um, to lower the legal drinking limit to 0 0.05, which is real. When I when when we talk a little more about it, that's not a lot of alcohol, 0 0.05. Um, and so it'll be curious to see, like, will other states take that conservative approach and lower their rates as well? Um, so yeah, so binge drinking is, is really drinking a certain number of drinks. For, uh, for men, it would be five or more drinks in a sitting, which is, which is like a two-hour time frame. Or for women, it's uh, four or more drinks. And then an alcohol use disorder is a chronic relapsing brain disease that's characterized by compulsive use, loss of control, and negative emotional state. So risk is defined. So the National Institute for Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, which is an arm of the federal government that does research on alcohol, uh, has looked across population studies. So it looks across studies of healthy adults, and it looks to see at what level do you, do you start to have trouble af after you've been drinking. And so it's based, these limit, these, um, these low risk limits are based on thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And they're just healthy adults that participate in research, right? So at what level do you start to have trouble? So for men, for younger men, uh, uh, less than 65, low risk limits are cons in, a, in a single day, no more than four drinks per day, or no more than 14 drinks a week. For women, the rates are lower, so, or the limits are lower. So it's no more than three drinks a day and no more than seven drinks a week. For older adults, so people age 65 and older, they recommend the same levels for women. So no more than three drinks a day, no more than seven in a week. Why, how come women get, how, how, how come women get shorted? How come we get cheated out of how much we can drink? Size, Size yeah. What, why, what are some other reasons why uh, women can't drink as much as men, or shouldn't drink as much as men? No, uh, not, not reproduction, but you're, you're on, I think you're on the right track. Hormonal. Yeah, women, um, women are, like, women's bodies are composed differently than men. Like, the, uh, the like, the... Um, the ratio of fat and water is different among women than men usually. Um, <laughs> I know, it's so sad. Um, yeah, just metabolism, just we metabolize alcohol at a different rate than men do. Um, so yeah, it, ha it definitely has, it, it has a lot to do with just how women are, like how our bodies are composed versus how men's um, bodies are composed. What we see oftentimes is when men and women drink together, women tend to have a telescoping behavior where we try to keep up with our male counterparts. So if we're, if we're out, you know, if, if you're at a bar with a man and he's drinking, you know, a beer every 20 minutes, oftentimes women will like keep up with the man, right? And drink a beer every 20 minutes. She will have a higher blood alcohol content and be more impaired than he will because just because of how we're just how, how our bodies are made. Um, so that's risk. So, so low risk, you want to stay below these limits. And you don't want to do one or the other. It's really, you want to, for men, no more than four drinks a day and no more than 14 drinks a week. So if you, if you go out and you have 10, 10 drinks, you're, like, you're drinking at high risk levels, even though you have 14 drinks across the week. I'm confused about what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> because when you say low risk and I'm looking at four drinks and of course I'm coming at this as a nurse. Uh -huh. To me that seems like a lot for for somebody to be drinking four drinks daily. Mm -hmm. Well it's not so it wouldn't be four drinks daily because you want you want to remember you no more 14 drinks a week so really that's two drinks a day. Okay. Right that's why it's the so and it's not one or the other. So, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah so we're not recommending that men can drink four drinks a day across seven days. That's 28 drinks. That's way over the limit. Okay, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not one or the other, it's and. Yeah. No more than like three on the weekends and then like nothing on a Monday, Tuesday kind of thing. That's right. So you, you, go, you, go, to, you, you go to a wedding and you have a couple, yeah. you go to a wedding, you have a couple glasses of wine, then you're not going to do that every day. I mean, if you do, you're drinking at high risk levels. So if you 
have somebody that's a patient that's drinking, let's say, two glasses of wine at dinner every day and then goes out on the weekends and, you know, has, you know, five, six glasses. Mm -hmm. They're over the, they're over the lower slumps, yeah. Over okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have one glass of wine in a bar, you are, that's like two glasses of wine, really. If you look at the, the Oh, bar, that's a good segue. About. That's a good segue, <laughs> my friends. I'll pay you later. Yeah, so, so this is interesting information but what does it mean like when you're talking about drinks there is a specific <coughs> definition for what is considered a standard drink and you're, you, you'll be surprised perhaps about what those um, definitions are so it depends on the amount of alcohol remember before it was a standard drink has uh, four, was it 14 grams of pure alcohol so you all know if uh, that beer and wine and and spirits are all different right in terms of how much alcohol is in that beverage. And so the, the standard drink definitions, 12 ounces of regular beer. So regular beer is, is something that's considered like 5% alcohol. So like a Budweiser or something like, some, you know, some, a domestic, sort of a domestic beer. Coors Light and Miller Light, they probably have a slightly less percent alcohol. We all, you know, we're here we are in California. Lots of microbreweries have been popping up all over the country. California's got probably some of the best beer in the whole world um, and a lot of the beer that's manufactured here and beyond and everywhere is really high alcohol right you've got IP double IPAs could be like 10 percent so a standard drink of beer is 12 is basically a can a 12 ounce can of Budweiser um, malt liquor so something like Old English or so you know like Old English is, is probably one of the more popular ones that has a higher percent of alcohol and so you can you can't drink as much right so it's only eight or nine ounces of a malt beverage now what sometimes you see folks with like a 40 like a 40 ounce beer that's a lot of drinks right if you th if you think about it a 40 ounce of Old E is like five standard drinks four or five standard drinks depending or a lot of times people drink like the 22 ounce bombers those are, there's multiple drinks, and it's not just one be b bottle of beer, right? It's multiple drinks within that one bottle. Table wine, so your, you know, Cabernet, your Pinot Grigio, five ounces. If you're drinking fortified wine, like if you're having after dinner, like a sherry or a port, three to four ounces is considered a standard drink. A cordial or a liqueur, two to three ounces. Um, brandy or a cognac is 1.5. And then most of your distilled, like your distilled spirits, so vodka, tequila, rum, uh, you can have an ounce and a half. So basically, it's um, it's like you know, like when you have a double-sided shot glass, it's the it's it's like the I think it's like the bigger part of that shot glass. One and a half ounces is what is what that is considered. How about um, uh, a Long Island iced tea? Has anyone ever had an LIT? Yeah, so that basically is all the clear alcohols, right? So it's all the clear alcohols with some Coca-Cola and sometimes like a, they squeeze lemon in there. One LIT is like five standard drinks. Could be, right? Because if, if it's a shot of all the clear alcohols and you have three or four or five clear alcohols, it could be um, several standard drinks. So to show you sort of this in action, I'm going to move away from the podium. So this is a standard drink of vodka. Doesn't look like much, right? This is a 12 ounce beer. It's just blue so you can all see it. It's not really beer, it's water. Um, but so this is 12 ounces, right? And what we find is that when you go to a restaurant and you order a beer, they serve it to you in a pint glass, which is 16 ounces. And so even if you're drinking a pint of Budweiser, you're drinking more than one standard drink. Because if they served it to you like this, you'd be like, where's the rest of my beer, <laughs> right? And then if you, go, if, you're, if you happen to be a wine drinker and you go to a restaurant or you drink, from, drink at home, you've got these giant wine glasses, right? Like restaurants serve these like beautiful wine glasses. That's five ounces. Do you feel like you're being cheated? It's like, why is it not bigger, right? And what we find is that a lot of times bartenders will pour up to like there, right? Because they want to make the glass look full. 
So you're drinking a glass of wine, but it's got more than one standard drink in it oftentimes. I think like, well, you tell me, how many glasses of wine can you get out of a wine bottle? <laughs> how many standard drinks are in a wine, in a standard size wine bottle? It's five. You're supposed to be able to get five glasses of wine out of a wine bottle. Is that what normally happens? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the definition of standard drink is super important. And when you're talking with your patients, and, you're, and if, if it comes up in conversation, of, you know, what, what they drink, how much they drink, they don't know that, they don't know this oftentimes. They don't know what a standard drink is. And so you really have to, if they say, oh, I have one drink a day, what, what is it? Like, what are they drinking? What kind of alcohol? What kind of glass are they using? Like, if they're, if they're using a pint glass and they're drinking one glass of vodka, that's like 10, more than 10 standard drinks, right? Because it's now an ounce and a half of vodka is a standard drink. And so just for you all to know, like, as you're talking with your patients, what they're drinking and how much, like, what glass they're using is super, super important so that you can assess if they're drinking at risky levels. So any questions about standard drinks or risky, uh, low risk limits? Are some of you like, hmm, I think I drank at uh, high risk levels over the weekend? <laughs> yes? Champagne is similar to, to wine in terms of like what's considered a standard drink. It has about the same amount of alcohol in it as wine. Some, I mean, some champagnes are um, or Prosecco have like slightly less, but for the most part, it's champagne and Prosecco is about the same as a like Chardonnay or Pinot Grigio or one of those. Yeah. Do you happen to know what Thunderbird has? I think that's that about Thunderbird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's is, is it, I, I was just gonna ask, is it even around? Anything? Is Thunderbird like Boone's Farm or like Mad Dog Twenty? <laughs> It's like Boone's Farm. Oh. I got some reaction. <laughs> I just remember, I thought it was like 20%. It's, it's, it's a malt beverage, so it's got a higher percentage. Yeah. Y'all have, everyone, you know, y'all, if you consume alcohol, you all have that, like, memory of, like, drinking something like that and how you, how you felt the next day. Yeah. Because this goes back to a former training we did. There was something called Four Loco. <laughs> and so that was like mixed with ginseng? Or so Four, yeah, Four Loco was a, was, it was served in like a, I don't know, I think a 16 ounce can. And it had, um, it had a, it, had, it was like an energy, it was like an alcoholic energy drink. So it had like, what is it, tor, what's that, taurine? Yeah. Taurine? Um, yeah, that they took that off the market because people like people were drinking massive quantities of it and they were doing really bad things. They were driving, you know, they were driving intoxicated. They were holding up liquor. You know, it was it was it was not on the market for very long. Yeah. My, my understanding of that is that the, the caffeine and energy and stimulus basically keeps you from getting tired and sleeping at all. So yeah. You just stay so you up just, you just, just stay up and you keep drinking. Away. Yeah. Yeah. Danger. So same thing with like, I mean, Red Bull and all some of those other ones are not they do not have alcohol, but that's like that's a separate training. The the stimulant impact of those types of beverages is is really is problematic in a lot of for a lot of folks. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So alcohol. So what does it do? So why do you why do you get intoxicated when you drink alcohol? Can you all hear that? Let me try to get this louder. Hang on. Let's let's do this again. Bear with me one second. I'm just going to... Oh, boy. I don't want to blast your eardrums. Let's see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Two Minute ah, Neuroscience, where we're studying neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I'll discuss alcohol. 
How alcohol acts in the central nervous system is still poorly understood. Two of the best known effects of alcohol, however, are its actions on GABA and glutamate receptors. Alcohol increases GABA activity at a subtype of the GABA receptor known as GABA-A. The mechanism by which this occurs is still not clear, but it is thought that alcohol may act as a positive allosteric modulator, meaning it binds to a site on the receptor that is separate from where GABA binds, and increases the effect GABA has when it binds to the receptor itself. The immediate effect of this action typically is the inhibition of neural firing. Alcohol also inhibits the activity of glutamate receptors. Again, the mechanism for this is not fully understood, but because glutamate is generally excitatory, inhibition by alcohol initially leads to the reduction of neural activity. A long list of other synaptic actions have been linked to alcohol, including, but not limited to, activation of serotonin receptors, enhancement of glycine receptor function, inhibition of adenosine reuptake, inhibition of calcium channels, activation of potassium channels, and modulation of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor function. It's not clear, however, how relevant each of these effects are to the human use of alcohol. There are also some large-scale effects associated with alcohol. For example, alcohol stimulates dopamine transmission in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, an action thought to be associated with the reinforcement of alcohol consumption. Alcohol affects motor coordination and balance, potentially in part through its influence on neurons in the cerebellum. And it inhibits long-term potentiation and other mechanisms of synaptic plasticity in the hippocampus, which may contribute to its memory-disrupting effects. Who's confused? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't joke. Um, I, so I searched for a video that would succinctly describe how alcohol works in the brain. This is a, this is a pretty good video. Um, but it's complicated, right? Because there's multiple things happening simultaneously when you consume alcohol. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes walking us through it in a little bit more detail and a, and a, and a little more simplified. Because none of us are, neuro, are, are, is anyone a neuroscientist in the room? Yeah, I'm, I'm not either. I, I mean, I went, I have my undergrad in biology, but uh, like this is so not, like most people don't study this um, and, and know it in and out. So there's basically four neurotransmitters that are implicated in alcohol. The first two are endogenous opioids and dopamine. So we all have, we all have naturally occurring opioids and receptors in our brain and body, right? And so endogenous opioids help to, what do they do? They help to deaden pain and they cause euphoria. So when you drink alcohol, your like it, it binds to your endogenous opioid receptors and it causes this feeling of euphoria, right? When you first start, when you first start drinking, you, you're like, oh, I feel good, I feel great. Dopamine, so it also impacts the dopamine system in your reward center, like so that in the, the, the mesolimbic system, like where uh, in deep in your brain, anything that feels good causes a spike in dopamine. So walking on the beach with your boyfriend, having a really good cheeseburger at dinner, using methamphetamine, right? Anything that feels good, it's because your dopamine is being increased in your reward center. And if you think about it, it's kind of, it's based, it's how we've survived as a species, right? Because if things like food and sex didn't feel good, we would not be here. We wouldn't be walking on this planet. So it's really about like just procreation, right? Making new humans and surviving through eating, um, through eating basically. Now the other side, so the other two neurotransmitters, and these are the ones you hear a lot about with alcohol, are GABA and glutamine. This, and this is confused, like, so this, I find this to be confusing, so we're going to, like, we're going to slow down and, and take it step by step. Glutamate is excitatory, so it speeds you up, right? GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it slows you down. Now, if you're, so, so this happens in our brain just normally, like without the, um, without alcohol. When you're like, when you're at home after a full day of work and you've had your dinner and you're like sitting on the couch watching TV and you start to feel sleepy, right? You start to get, oh, maybe it's time for me to go to bed. Your GABA, like your GABA and glutamate system sort of self-regulate one another. And when you feel sleepy, that's the GABA, right? It's the inhibitory, it's slowing you down. Then when you wake up in the morning and you're taking a shower and you're getting ready to go to work, 
glutamate is sort of kicked in. So it's speeding you up. It's getting you ready for the day. So in normal circumstances, your system regulates itself. It knows when to kick up one or the other, like to kick in GABA or to kick in glutamate. Question? Yeah. So if a person takes a sleep aid, um, how does that kind of inhibit or does it help the GABA? So, the, so sleep aids would help to dampen the f effects of glutamate, right? Because you want, because glutamate is going to speed you up. You want to counteract that to, to help you go to sleep. So it's going to inhibit your glutamate. So it's, gonna, it's sort of going to block the glutamate and allow GABA to do its work. <coughs> Is my is like my simple understanding of like how those work? Yeah. Okay. So how does what what happens with alcohol? So step one, you drink you drink a beer or you have a glass of wine or you do a shot of whiskey, whatever. So what happens? So there's like two like it it almost is like two parallel processes. So that like two things are happening simultaneously. On the one side, you've got your endogenous opioids are released into the pleasure centers into the reward center of your brain. And in response to that, dopamine is released, right? Or dopamine is increased. And so you feel good. So that's like that initial intoxication is that like, oh, now I'm feeling good. I'm gonna go on the dance floor. I'm gonna like talk to people. That's, the, that's like the dopamine that's working in your brain. Makes you feel good. It reinforces repeat behavior. It's gonna make you wanna drink more, right? Because it feels good. So that's sort of, in my, like the way I think about it, that's the easy part to understand. Here's the part that's a little more difficult. So the other thing that's happening when you drink alcohol is GABA, so the inhibitory neurotransmitter, is increased. So alcohol causes GABA to increase, which slows down your brain. So that's where you get the like drowsiness when you're intoxicated, like you feel, start feeling a little sleepy perhaps. That's the GABA doing its work. That's the GABA is slowing your brain down, decreasing your reaction time, um, de messing up your coordination. That's GABA doing its job. So over time, the brain thinks, uh-oh, too much GABA, too much GABA. I gotta, we got to self-regulate. And so, it, so there's more receptors are created for glutamate, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter, right? So what happens is you get sort of this counterbalance. So GABA, you know, they, it, it, you've got this increase in GABA, which is inhibitory. So now your brain wants to increase glutamate to balance everything out. And so the balance is restored, right? Because the brain starts to, like, more glutamate is released. My, are you all with me so far? All right, so we're going to look at it with pictures. So GABA slows you down. Glutamate speeds you up. So you introduce alcohol, in this case it's a beer, and remember at first your GABA system is activated, so it slows you down. It's, it gives you that fogginess, that intoxication. What your brain does is it tries to balance things out, right? So, uh, so glutamate is up, there's an uptick in glutamate, and balance is restored. But what happens is the more you drink, GABA, right? It's causing your GABA to be increased, so it's, it's slowing your brain down. And what your brain's going to do, well, what happens is GABA gets so much more than glutamate that you've got this, you're completely out of balance. And so your brain tries to fix that by increasing your glutamate, right? So there's always this, like, process of trying to, to balance things out and, re, like, to get back to normal. Now, over time, it takes more alcohol to feel the effect, right? Just like any, just like any s drug. Over time, once you've, once you've been using it, you, your body builds a tolerance, so you need more to get that same effect. Same thing happens with alcohol. What happens if you stop drinking? So you have a person who's been drinking for 15 years, they've gotten themselves into some trouble, they decide that they're gonna go into, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna go to treatment and they're gonna s stop using alcohol. So what happens is, because the brain is trying to regulate again and by, in, by increasing glutamate, there comes a time where in the absence of that ongo in the absence of the alcohol that the, that the brain is used to having in its system, your glutamate system is way, way, way overactivated. So remember, glutamate is your excitatory neurotransmitter. 
So your brain is like completely hyperactive. And what that feels like is withdrawal. Like you get the withdrawal symptoms from not drinking anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, so at least in early, like at least early on when someone stops drinking, there, there's this hyperactivity of the glutamate system. So it's that speedy, you know, it's, it's, that, it's, the speedy, it's the speed you up neurotransmitter. And then the GABA system is completely deregulated or dysregulated. So it takes your brain time to get back to normal. So that, it's that like post acute withdrawal that you feel. And sometimes it takes people weeks to feel normal after they stop drinking. If their brain is used to drinking, uh, used to alcohol, and then you take it away, it takes time for the brain to regulate itself. Um, which is why there are medications, like there, there's medications that we'll talk about later that have been developed to help address this, what's happening in your brain. Make sense? Yeah. So tolerance, so, um, so as, the, as your brain desires, right, so that upregulation of the glutamate system works at least for a while, and you, got, you have a correction of the imbalance. But if you continue to drink, it takes more alcohol to override the glutamate system to feel the same level of intoxication. And that's what tolerance is, is where it takes more, of the, it takes more alcohol to get that initial effect that you, that you had when you first started drinking. So that's all I'm going to say about the, neuro, like the neurotransmission or neurobiology of alcohol. Um, just remember, endogenous opioids and dopamine are w sort of one process. That's the, what makes you feel good. And then the GABA and glutamate is the other part. And if you think about just the inhibitory and the, exci the excitatory, like that, that's sort of is what's happening simultaneously in your brain. So what is alcohol? Um, alcohol or ethyl alcohol, it's, so we've, we've already talked about the fact that there's different amounts of alcohol in um, alcoholic beverages, whether it's beer, or wine, liquor. Most often people drink alcohol orally, like you drink it, um, but you can basically you can inject alcohol. You can use it. You can use alcohol in a suppository. You any orifice that you have in your body, you can introduce alcohol to it. It's not going to feel good, right? Snorting alcohol, and it's not like that's just not how people drink, right? People drink alcohol orally most of the time. Um, oh, some of the acute effects is you you get that sedation, right? The slowing down of the feeling. You get the euphoria from the release of dopamine. Um, alcohol lowers your heart rate and your respiration, and so, you know, you hear oftentimes about people having an, like overdosing from alcohol. It's because their heart rate drops so low and they and they stop breathing. Um, so there is a chance, like some drugs, you know, some drugs don't kill you. Alcohol can kill you by itself, like not not even with the help of opioids or meth or anything. Um, it impairs your coordination. It slows down your reaction time, which is why it's so problematic that people drink and drive. Um, which is probably why the um, state of Utah lowered the um, legal limit because it hope, it's hoping that people will be deterred from driving if they've been intoxicated. So chronically, um, so at least at, you know, with most drugs, like the acute effects, like when you start, when you first start using substances, a lot of it is positive, right? Like if you think about methamphetamine, like when someone first starts using meth, they feel really good, right? They have energy, they lose a little bit of weight, they're able to stay up, they're able to party, like. And with most things, like uh, the acute effects are largely positive, but the chronic effects, not so much, right? Over time, it really starts to impact your ability to walk, walk on the, like walk and, you know, walk around. So some of the mild to moderate symptoms, you've got, uh, you could have mild anxiety, uh, headaches, um, diaphoresis. Anyone, does anyone, everyone know what that is, diaphoresis? Like uncontrollable sweating, yeah. Heart palpitations, um, you can have some GI issues. Now, you could, so if you have, um, if someone decides they're gonna withdraw, they're gonna stop drinking on their own, that's really, that could be very dangerous, right? If you decide to withdraw from alcohol without the assistance of a medical provider, you can, you can end up very, very sick. And so, some of the, like, so if you, if you have someone who's in withdrawal, um, there are certain indications that you would really want to get them linked in either with a hospital or a medical provider. 
if they've got a history, if they're experiencing delirium tremens, is that, does anyone know what, a, the, what DT is, delirium tremens? What is it? Can someone tell me? Mm -hmm. Almost, they, I don't want to say Parkinson's, but in some cases when I've seen them in the hospital. Yeah. They, it, they look like they have a movement disorder. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, like a huge hangover. Like a massive, massive, yeah, you have, like bad. bad, it's bad. DT, like, most people never experience delirium tremens, and thank goodness for that, because it's, they're, it's awful. Um, depression, suicidal ideation. Uh, so there's so those are some of the indications where you'd want to get someone hospitalized and to get medical with like to get medical help with withdrawing. So long term, if you if you work if you're working with patients who have been using alcohol for a really long time, or if you have a family member who you know has been using alcohol, these are some of the long term effects of alcohol. So pretty like pretty major stuff, right? So uh, increased risk of high blood pressure. Uh, there are major impacts on your liver, so whether it's cirrhosis or jaundice or um, diabetes. You have a lot of GI issues, so ulcers, hemp bleeding, like, you know, internal bleeding. Uh, some, you get some deficiencies in things like thiamine and other types of um, um, vitamins and, and um, enzymes and things that are important for just ongoing, like, longevity and, and health. Uh, we know that, the, we, know, we all know the impact of drinking alcohol while you're pregnant. So that you've got the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. There could be a whole host of issues with um, drinking while you're pregnant. So binge drinking. So that pattern of drinking a bunch all at once has its own set of impacts or dangers. Unintentional injuries. So that could be falling, um, getting burned, uh, crashing your car. Uh, violence. There, you know, the, it could be homicide, suicide, uh, intimate partner violence. Uh, so. Um, you think when you think about violence, when you think about drugs and violence, like what are some of the drugs that are most linked or most associated with violence? Meth, Meth. <coughs> PCP, <laughs> yeah, PCP is a big one. Um, alcohol actually is has the highest association with violence, more so than meth. <laughs> does anyone know what? Um, does anyone know the day of the year where there's the most violence? Super Bowl Sunday, yeah. I would think New Year's too, but Super Bowl Sunday, if you look at the literature, Super Bowl Sunday is, asso it has, it is associated with the highest reports or incidents of, partner, um, of violence in general, intimate partner violence, getting in fights at the bar while they're watching the Super Bowl. And so, yeah, it's, and, it's, and it's mostly because of alcohol, right? Because people drink when they're watching the Super Bowl in a lot of, in a lot of cases. Um, if, if, you ha if someone is experiencing an o uh, alcohol overdose, here are some of the things that, they, that might be happening. Their skin will be clammy, like they'll be like really like sweaty. Um, they might turn blue, and that has a lot to do with the way that they're breathing or, or not breathing. So their breathing slows down and it becomes irregular, so it's very like sporadic breathing and, and very um, labored, so they're having a hard time breathing. Vomiting, seizures. A lot of times with vomiting, if if you have someone who falls asleep while they're intox while they're like majorly intoxicated and they they're, they're, they fall asleep on their back, that's super dangerous because if they throw up, they can they can basically choke and 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 that a lot of times it's the vomiting that causes people to die because they they vomit and there's nowhere for the vomit to go because they're on their back and so they end up um, in in serious trouble. Y'all familiar with the DSM? Changes from, from, from four to five. So before DSM-5, we, we talked about things like alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence. The new term it, to describe a sort of a continuum or a spectrum of um, disorder is called an alcohol use disorder. So there's three classifications. You have mild AUD, moderate AUD, or severe AUD. And it depends on how many symptoms you're, you, you have as to whether you're considered mild, moderate, or severe. Um, some other changes that the DSM-5 did, they eliminated legal problems as a criterion. In the DSM-4, legal problems was a criteria, criterion. Um, craving was added as a criterion for diagnosis. And um, 
there's been revised descriptions with updated language. So there's lots of changes between DSM-4 and DSM-5. Yeah. Yeah, in the DSM-5, it's no longer a criterion. So you can get three DUIs and it wouldn't be part of it? It would not lead to a diagnosis. Oh. Yeah. But it's but all like like all the other like a lot of the other criteria like the stuff that was in the DSM four is still there. It's just legal problems was removed as a. I don't know I don't know what the justification is for why they did that, but that. I think the assumption is that if you got three DUIs and you're going to meet criteria that are regardless to five anyway. So that's you're right. Trigger the diagnosis. Yeah, like someone if someone you're you're exactly right. If someone has three DUIs, like that's not their only problem. There there's they're going to have a whole host of other criteria that that will give them that diagnosis. So questions about effects. You with me so far? OK, good. How are we on time? What time is it? 9 o'clock. Oh, we're like rock and rolling. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about the data. In, in the first version of this curriculum, as I was working to create this new one, the first version has like a, a lot of data slides, so like way too many. So I made the decision to pare it down and just give you the highlights. And so we're going to kind of look across a few different indicators. So I, I'm an epidemiologist by training, so I have my MPH in epi and quantitative statistics, so I love data. Like I could talk about data all day. But it's really not necessary. What's important is that when you're looking for patterns and trends with a specific substance, whether it's alcohol or methamphetamine or opioids, no one indicator is going to tell you the whole story, right? You need to look across. You need to look at things like prevalence data, general population data. You need to look at treatment statistics. You need to look at what's happening amongst young people, like so looking at school surveys. And so what you'll see in the next few minutes is data from across a variety of indicators. And you'll, you'll start to see that there are some consistent patterns across these different data sources. So there's something, um, there's a national data source called the National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions. So NISARC is the acronym. And it looks at the prevalence of alcohol use in the general population. And so it's an annual survey. Um, it's been collected for, oh gosh, it's been around for decades. And what it does is it looks across, I mean, it's like, Oh, I think it's like, I think I, I think I have it in here. So in this, in this particular data set, there was over 36,000 people who were surveyed. And they, they looked across a variety of, a variety of alcohol-related indicators. So what I'm showing you here on the far left-hand side is the overall prevalence across those 36,000 people. Of those, in, in, of those people, annual prevalence was about 14%. So 14% of the population drinks alcohol in the past, drank alcohol in the past year. Um, lifetime prevalence of alcohol. Oh no, I'm sorry, this is alcohol use disorder. So these are people who are diagnosed with an AUD. So annual prevalence, 13.9. Lifetime prevalence, so an AUD anytime in their lives, 29%. The rest of the bars are showing populations where there's a higher prevalence. And this, this is substantiated across indicators. So we know Native Americans have higher prevalence of alcohol use disorder than other ethnic counterparts. Um, younger people, so we see a higher percentage of younger folks have an AUD than older people. And that really holds true with all drugs. Like if you look at um, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, it, usually, it, ca it categorizes people into like age groups 12 to 17, 18 to 25, and 26 and older. That 18 to 25 year age group is, oh, always has the highest prevalence. What happens during that time? Everything. Everything. <laughs> Their brains are developing or maturing. They go to college. It's just the age where people start to experiment with drugs. And so we see across the board that 18 to 25 year age group oftentimes has the highest prevalence across drugs. So younger people, men have a higher prevalence than women. And um, white respondents, so Caucasian respondents, had higher prevalence than the, just slightly higher than the overall. Um, 
So in looking, this is data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. So this, again, is another annual survey. It looks at um, tobacco use, alcohol use, and drug use. And it is probably one of the better indicators we have. It's not perfect. No data source is perfect. Um, you, have to, you have to sort of make the assumption that these are all like underrepresentations of what's happening in reality. Uh, and it's just a lot of it is because of the limitations of the survey itself. It's a household survey. You have to have a phone to, to be part of it. You have, um, it's, it's general US population. It doesn't capture people who are incarcerated or who, who are in like um, institutions, um, whether it's hospitals or uh, other types of institutions. And so it's definitely not 100% accurate, but it, it, it's better than nothing. So this is showing you, you see the rates of current alcohol use, binge alcohol use, and heavy alcohol use. So in the US, there's an, about 140 million alcohol users. That's a lot of people, right? How many people live in the US? 360 million. Yeah, it's like, it's like three, six, so somewhere around there. So it's, but so this, what this is showing you, this doesn't mean that we have 140 million people with an alcohol use disorder. These are just people who drink any alcohol, right? So they go to a wedding, they have a glass of champagne, they would answer affirmatively to this question. If you compare, like, so I like to provide context because what, like, it's like, what does that mean? Like, what's that number mean? If you look at other drugs, um, marijuana is, oh gosh, what's the number? I think marijuana is like in the 20s, like 20 something million people are current marijuana users. Prescription opioids is number two. And then you've got I think, in, I think according to this data source, about a million people say that they use methamphetamine. Uh, and it, heroin, and heroin's about the same. So I'm just giving those numbers just to sort of give you the context. Of the current alcohol users, these next two data source points are the more important ones, in my opinion, because it's looking at problematic use or risky use. So you've got about 66 million people said that they drank alcohol in a binge pattern in the past year, or actually currently. Um, so about almost about half of the alcohol users. So of those 140 million people, about half of them are drinking at risky levels, or they're drinking, they're 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 putting themselves at risk for um, for adverse health effects. Of the binge users, six about 17 million are considered heavy alcohol users. So what that means is several episodes of binge drinking in a in a month. I think it's like five or more days of binge drinking. So those are the folks who are drinking a lot of alcohol often. So those are really the, those are really the folks we, we're, we're most concerned about because they're putting themselves at risk for a whole variety of issues. One thing I forgot to mention, I'm going to say it now even though it doesn't quite fit. When we were talking about the, the um, low risk drinking limits and we, you know, we said men and women and then older people, people who are living with HIV we ought, we, the recommendation is that they drink at even le lower rates than the regular, like than folks who do not have HIV. And it ha you'll see why in just a little bit, but just remember that. So those, those recommended limits, we, the, we, ex we want them to be even lower for people who are living with HIV. And you'll see why in just a, a few minutes. So if you look at people 12 to 20, they, a lot of times they're the focus of stu studies because alcohol, right, drinking is not legal for people under the age of 21 in the U.S. And so in looking at 12 to 20 year olds, this is, these are just the patterns. So about 19 per, about 20 percent said they used alcohol in the past month. It's a pretty high percentage, right? About 12 percent binge drank and about 3 percent had multiple episodes of binge drinking. But there is good news. It's not all bad news. We have seen over time, so this is data from 2002 to 2017. It doesn't seem like a crazy decrease, but there ha there's a decreasing trend in current alcohol use. That's good news, right? Fewer kids are drinking now than they were 10 years ago. It's, and it's statistically significant. It's not just a little blip. There's, it's been a consistent pattern we're seeing um, across time, which is, which is good. Um, if you look at lifetime use of alcohol, so again, oh, so this is alcohol use among kids, among uh, students, so 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. So any alcohol use 
having ever been drunk or drinking flavored alcohol beverages, so like wine coolers and those types of things. Um, these are the, the, the data, this is the data, and it's not surprising, 12th graders have higher prevalence than 8th graders. Um, so we see over time, you're looking at this information. So that's any, that's lifetime use. That's like drinking, you know, drinking one time ever. This is current use. So again, you see the same pattern, like 12th graders have higher percentages than 8th graders. Um, but we still see, I, so I find this to be slightly alarming, right? There's a lot of kids who are, who are drinking to the point where they feel they're getting drunk or um, they're, they're not just like having a beer like before a football game. Um, and so that's, wh that's what you see. This is data from the Monitoring the Future survey. So binge drinking specifically. So this looks at data across two sources. You've got the youth risk, the youth risk behavior surveillance system and the behavior risk factor surveillance system. So there's C this is data from the CDC, from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And it's looking across these two data sources. So, so just some things to, to look at in, in this, uh, with this graph is you see binge drinking is concentrated among people 18 to 34, right, Th these two bars. Um, one in six adults binge drank four times a month, so like it, it works out to be about like once a week. Um, we see that binge drinking is twice as common among men than women, so most of you got that question correct at the beginning of the training. Um, and four in five binge drinks are consumed by men. So, we, so binge drinking is m a much bigger problem among men than it is among women. How about binge drinking among young people? So this is data from SAMHSA, so the, the household survey. 5.3 kids aged 12 to 17 reported binge drinking in the past month. It's one, that works out to 1.3 million kids. That's a lot of kids, right? Um, and then you see down here, you've got it, you've got it um, broken out by gender. So again, um, actually interestingly, among young people, females were more likely to binge drink than males. So overall, we see, me, we see binge drinking higher among men than women, but among young people, in this particular cut of data, the female number is higher. It's 6% versus 4.6%. And then you've got um, race, ethnicity, so non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, non-Hispanic Asian, um, American Indian Alaska Natives, non-Hispanic Asians, and then Hispanic. So the highest rate is... Uh, among whites followed by um, American Indian Alaska Natives. And these are kids ages 12, 12 to 17. 17. Not, even in not even in college yet. Mm -hmm. So middle school and high school. Right. I know as I have a kid going into middle school, I'm like, oh, oh my gosh. Um, so okay, again, no, no, not all doom and gloom. Here's some other good news. We're seeing decreases in first use. So we're seeing decreases in the incidence of alcohol which I love. I love, like, this is the kind of data where, because this is promising, right? If, if, if fewer kids are starting to drink, then the hope is that fewer kids are going to get in trouble with the drinking. And so uh, if you look at 2002 versus 2017, we saw a statistically significant drop in alcohol at first, like a first drink of alcohol. And we also saw drops in marijuana and cigarette use. So good news all around, right? Fewer kids are starting to drink and smoke and... Yeah. They're talking about cigarettes. So they're not talking about they're not talking about vaping. Okay. Vaping, unfortunately, we're seeing increasing trends. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing decreasing trends in traditional cigarettes, you know, like Marlboros or whatever. We're seeing increases, like very alarming increases in jewels and um, other types of e-cigarettes. I'm going to skip over that because that's I already presented that data. So looking at um, looking at treatment data. So you have someone who goes into a publicly funded program, and upon admission, they're asked a series of questions, and one of them is, "What is your primary drug of abuse? What is bringing you here to treatment?" Now, when you go to treatment, you can list up to three substances. So you have a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary substance. There's five, one, two, three, or six, no five. Uh, basic counting. There's five substances that make up like 90% of all treatment emissions. Alcohol across the board is the highest across the U.S. Now in California, 
what do you what do you all think the highest percentage is? Primary substance of abuse at admission. Nope. Meth. Meth. Yeah. yeah. You know so, what I find interesting is that yeah. with, with some of the detox programs, I would say most of them, that a person has to identify um, alcohol as the main substance in order to get in. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, did everyone hear that? So a lot of times, like with detox, you have to mention alcohol as the primary in order to get into the program. And so that's an artifact of the data, right? Just it's 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 part of the problem with the system is the system is broken. Um, but <coughs> in this case, in most places in the country, alcohol really is the number one substance of abuse. And they also do they also smoke weed and they also do take pills from time to time. But we see consistently that alcohol is number one. Although across the U.S., we what we're seeing well, which is why when Tom mentioned there's lots of money being um, being funneled into work around opioids, because we have seen a consistent uptick in opioid um, primary opioid treatment admissions, and it for the first time in 2015 it it went above alcohol, um, and then you've got. Uh, marijuana has sort of been pretty stable, pretty level, and then you've got cocaine and methamphetamine. Nationally, those are towards the bottom. In places like California, they're towards the top. Yeah, question. Yeah, we actually did. We actually have a whole training on that that uh, we did last, last year, right? So um, we'll get, we're gonna completely go down a rabbit hole if we talk about it too much, but they're um, surprisingly in places like, w California, it's been legal for what, two years? Is that right? But in places like Den uh, Colorado, Washington State, it's been legal for longer. For the most part, they're not seeing huge increases in use. So it's not as if it, co it becomes legal and people start smoking. Um, and especially among kids too, like they're not seeing huge increases in, in uh, prevalence in places where marijuana is recreationally available. Um, but there, but I can link you with the, there's, uh, we have a whole training that has all kinds of st statistics. And yes, there's a lot of research being done to monitor that, to make sure. And there, in places like California, uh, there's a lot of efforts. There's a very big um, advocacy towards making sure kids don't get access to it. There's a lot of um, like local, uh, what's the word? Like a lot of the control is at the local level, like at the like level of the town or the city. Um, whereas it's, it's not the state saying what you can do, it's local jurisdictions are coming up with, with rules about where, where you can open a dispensary, how many you can have near a school, what you can do in terms of advertising. So there's a really strong, Lynn Silver at the Public Health Institute is leading that effort mm -hmm. in terms of like, empowering local jurisdictions to limit the availability. Um, but it's not, you would, like you would expect there'd be a huge increase and there really hasn't been. There, there are more people that are smoking now than there were two years ago. Um, this data, this is illicit use. So it's, it's really like, it's not medical marijuana. It's really that illicit use of marijuana in, in this data source. It's a great, great question and we, we could talk for hours about that. So there is an unfortunate statistic around um, treat the treatment gap, and we see this with alcohol and with drugs at the federal level. So looking across the U.S., if you ha so if you ask people if they perceive a need for treatment, now this is specific to alcohol, 91% or almost 92% of, the, of people who have a diagnosable alcohol use disorder, so they have, they're using alcohol at levels that are putting them at major risk, they, their treatment, what treatment? I don't need treatment, I'm fine. I'm not using too much. Only 4% received, so if you look across, only 4% are receiving specialty treatment. So of, you know, so of, of those, I forget what the number is, but of the like 60 something million people, or wh whatever the statistic is, a very small percentage actually received specialty treatment for their alcohol use disorder. Another 4%, felt they had a need for treatment, but did not get treatment. So there, there is a lot of work that we can all be doing, right, to, to expand access. All the opioid money is being, um, is being released to the, to the state governments and to local communities to expand access to opioid treatment. There's a lot of work that needs to be done acro in, across the whole system. 
So alcohol messes up a lot of things. So it contributes to more than 200 diseases. So if you look across like all types of disorders and diseases, um, globally, it's, uh, it's the fifth leading risk factor for premature death. Um, almost 90,000 people die from alcohol-related causes each year. So it's the third leading cause of preventable, de preventable death. death sorry. Um, and impaired driving specifically accounts for about 10,000 deaths a year. So about a third of all driving fatalities have alcohol involved. In terms of alcohol's impact on the body, um, we see a lot of, uh, of liver-related, like a lot of liver disease and a lot of um, cirrhosis, like uh, nearly half of those deaths are, are attributable to alcohol use. And a, there's an alarming statistic, uh, especially among young people, where we saw an increase in liver disease deaths of about 65%. That's a huge increase. It was mostly among young people, so people aged 25 to 34, who would, nor like, normally people that age are relatively healthy, and they're not, they're not, they don't end up with liver disease. So it really, it's the, it's the link to alcohol that's really causing a lot of these deaths. People are dying early, and, they're ha and with major liver disease because of the alcohol that they're drinking. Alcohol-related liver disease accounts for one in three liver transplants, and it also is associated with a lot of different cancers. And it's not surprising. It's, all, it's the cancers like mouth cancer, esophagus, pharynx, larynx. It's like as alcohol is traveling through your body, right, to be, to be digested, we're seeing increases in those types of cancers, um, liver cancer and breast cancer. So the relationship between blood alcohol concentration and impairment. So this is, um, I know it's hard for you to see, so I'll walk you through it. So even at very low levels, so even at levels between zero, so no alcohol, and 0 0.05 blood alcohol concentration, there is mild impairment. You get mild um, slurred speech, you get like impacts on coordination, um, you get um, issues with balance, like being able to maintain balance. Um, and you start to even, even at those low levels, you, you get that sleepiness that you get, that you experience with, at higher levels. And then as you go up the arrow, the, the level of impairment increases. And so that's sometimes when you hear like of people getting in like a, um, getting in an accident and there, there's, an, it ends up being a DUI and you hear that they had a BAC of like 0.4. It's like, holy smokes, that's a lot, that's a very, very high blood alcohol concentration. Um, and so there is, you know, there is a relationship between as your blood alcohol concentration increases, so does the level of impairment. This is the kind of information that, I th that is helpful to share with patients because it helps them to see like that there is, like, there is a relationship between how much they're drinking and, how they're being, and, and their level of impairment. Um, and I, I find this particular infographic to be helpful. I, I didn't realize that at, like, at, that, at those really low levels that there was that mild impairment. So I think we're going to go ahead and take a break. This seems like a good time for us all to stretch our legs. So it is 9.20, and so we'll take a 15-minute break, and we'll resume at 9.35.